Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, tonight's fine home building webinar on uh, siding, um, choosing siding. Um, you know, maybe one of the the more important aspects of a home's appearance. You know, the kind of one of the things that that give a home its its curb appeal, and uh, certainly mm -hmm. a lot to do with uh, with durability. Um, and uh, we're going to get into all that stuff in just a few minutes. I do want to share. Uh, before we get started, and even before we get to the introductions of tonight's panelists, I just want to share quickly um, a little bit about Big Marker, the platform that you're um, that we're using for this webinar. Um, often people can't hear us; they know we're talking, they can't hear us. And and if that's the case, you might have to click right in the center of your screen to turn the sound on. Um, I think in some browsers it starts off muted. So if you're not hearing us, try. Um, well, maybe Jess can put that in the chat, actually, because if you're not hearing us, <laughs> you can't hear what I'm saying. I just realized. I almost that. said that, Brian. <laughs> Phil, you're going to have to jump in. I saw the look on your face. I said, what am I saying wrong here? <laughs> okay. So um, that's one thing. And then you also, you'll also see that there's both a uh, chat and a Q&A function. And uh, we, we want to, later on in the evening, um, and, and maybe as the evening goes on, we want to try to pull out some of your questions and uh, help out with some answers if we can. And uh, we'd appreciate it if you use the Q&A for your questions for us. Use the chat if you want to just kind of share a comment, talk amongst yourselves. Um, that way we won't, um, we'll find your questions um, and they won't, they won't kind of get lost in, in the chatter. So that's, that's it about Big Marker. You can also, if you have any other questions about how to use the platform, uh, throw them in the chat and we'll see if you, we can give you um, an answer. So we have a, an excellent panel tonight um, to talk about how to choose siding. And I'm going to uh, do some quick introductions. And I'm going to start with, uh, with Phil Kaplan, um, a New England-based architect um, at Kaplan Thompson Architects um, up in Maine. He's a member of the AIA. He's a lead accredited professional. And generally, Phil is a pretty involved guy. If you read his bio on his website, you'll see that he does some speaking, some teaching, some critiquing of architecture and judging of competitions. And he's very... Um, involved in, in the community. Um, but what I'm most interested about, Phil, is this philosophy that you have at your firm about of the not so big ego. So if you if you don't mind taking a moment just to share what what that means, it was very intriguing. Sure. You know, it it, it was sort of inspired by that classic architecture book by right? um, Sarah Susanka, The Not So Big House. And it was something that I that always spoke to me that, you know, I, I always um, took a little issue with sort of the pretension behind some architects that I had learned o under over the years. And it, it was an impetus for me to, to come out and kind of think, all right, this is not about me. This is about the client. This is about you know the planet. This is about um, beauty on the earth and how to turn those things around and, and, and really serve the people we work for and not make it about us, which is you know, obviously that's the, that's the typical thing that people think about architects. That's one of the bad things we get called on. Said, yeah, we're not going to do that. Yeah, that's really great. I, I think about that in the in the home building industry at large. It's really a service industry, right? Because we're doing this for people, you know, Absolutely. and we're going to to live you know healthy lives and happy lives in in their homes. So that's that's excellent. Uh, so next is is Chris Briley, uh, founding partner and principal at uh, Bryburn Architecture uh, with uh, Harry Hepburn, his his partner there. Um, Chris is also in Maine, and he's. Uh, He's a licensed architect, certified passive house um, consultant, and at uh, Bryburn also has a interesting ethos that I want to ask you about, Chris, and that's this idea of architecture for life. Uh, I, I, th I was wondering if you're going to do that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So architecture for life, it's it's it it has it's a la it has layered meanings where. Uh, it's, 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 it speaks to architecture that is um, respecting of our natural resources, our finite natural resources. It also is, um, much like uh, Phil's little slogan there, it's like, um, you know, uh, recognizing that we're doing this not for ourselves, but for the lives of the people who experience the building and for the lives of people who are going to come after us. And it is... Um, uh, also, you know, recognizing that the spaces that we are in, you know, they either um, enhance or detract from the life experiences that we're having. And so if our architecture enhances those lives, um, then then it's good architecture. That's what good architecture does. So that's. Yeah. 
layered meanings, but yeah, it's also, you know, deep into sustainability and, and what we do here. Right on. And together, um, uh, Chris and Phil host the Green Architect Lounge podcast. Um, I haven't I haven't heard an episode in a while. So what's what's going on with the podcast, fellas? That's Neither good. have I, Chris. What's up with that? <laughs> I don't know. I, this is outrageous. We need to talk to somebody. <laughs> we definitely. Who's behind this? <laughs> yeah, when, we were when, in a great groove, Brian. We were pretty. We were rocking it. We were right rocking up, it. up until uh, March. Let's say this damn 20. I don't know what happened then, but for some reason we slowed down. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it and then got, the place it, where we recorded it, it went out of business too, which is kind uh, of sad. So we're looking yeah. for another place to do our podcast. Yeah. We got, we got really spoiled actually going into a studio and speaking on real microphones and having cocktails. And then we were done talking. We say, that's it. We're good. We're good. Great. And we leave. <laughs> and then there's just like one review and we're done. I'm like, Oh, that's, that's how you do this stuff. Sure, it may cost a little money, but right. Whoa. Yeah, we were left at home just talking to each other, drinking cocktails, and <laughs> yes. it, so that didn't no do anybody any good. Mm -hmm. Our well, I, hope that, uh, uh, I hope that it comes back, and maybe we can be a part of that. We'll we'll talk about that offline. Um, sure. And our our last uh, panelist tonight is uh, Braden McClements, and he is a territory sales manager. Uh, for Boral Building Products. He's been there for more than 10 years, but Boral is not uh, Braden's introduction to the building industry. So Braden, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to uh, to Boral? Yeah, so, you know, growing up, my father and my grandfather built custom, semi-custom, so light commercial, and so I was always on a job site pushing the broom until I was old enough to carry a hammer, and then it was on to the races, and so for me, it was really about continuing on that legacy and, and providing, you know, a service and, and really having something tangible to leave behind, um, something that you can look at and be proud of. You know, as a kid, I remember driving past these places and my dad would say, you know what, I built that. My grandfather would say, I built that. And to become part of that and to leave, you know, hopefully a legacy for my children um, is really, really what drove me to that. But yeah, I've been with Boral for more than 10 years and Pre-pandemic was the technical installation manager for the West, and so had the opportunity to travel quite a bit and see a lot of different construction types and architecture design, and just been very fortunate. Yeah, that's great. Well, we're glad to have you, and we and Boral is our sponsor tonight, so we want to thank them for helping us helping us make the uh, make the webinar happen. Um, and uh, and we're we're glad that you, that you're here, Braden. So let's uh, let's not um, waste any more time. Let's get into uh, let's get into the, tonight's topic, which is choosing siding. So when I first started to to think a little bit about what we needed to um, what we needed to talk about tonight, I came up with some criteria um, for what for for choosing siding. And what came to mind quickly for me were, of course, style and cost and durability and installation details. Uh, there's painting and maintenance and there's sustainability or, you know, sort of responsibility. So um, does that list sound about right to you all? And is there anything that's that's not on that list that you think should be? Well, probably yeah. carbon and body carbon. Yeah. 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 First I on mean, my list, Chris. Yeah. Uh, only because that's, I mean, we all know, I mean, if anyone's paid any attention in the sustainability world, we're all about embodied carbon now. And we don't have to show that graph that shows the the amount of embodied carbon that's in a building kind of dwarfs the amount of operational carbon in a building. If your goal is like just, if you're shooting for 2030, I mean, now that's in less than 10 years and it's like, holy crap. So we have to be carbon neutral in 10 years. It almost... It, it's like what we build our buildings out of and the amount of carbon we put in the atmosphere doing that is going to be is far outweighs the operational cost when we're thinking like 100 years or that sort of thing. So it's it's a new way of thinking and it's kind of really affecting the sustain how we think about sustainability of all of our products these days. So, so maybe yeah, and, maybe. Um, oh, go, go ahead, Phil. Yeah. And just to be clear, embodied carbon has to do with the, the manufacture and transport primarily of materials that we use to our sites. Um, and it, frankly, you know, I, I think it's moved to the top of the list, as Chris said, you know, in importance, you know, in getting to net zero energy sure is important, but embodied carbon is a thing that we can change right now 
with the products that we specify that go in, into houses immediately. So that's a big deal. Yeah. So um, this this question was towards the towards the end of my list, but we're here now, so let's do it. Um, so <laughs> just just um just sorry. Help. Just to make sure everyone understands a couple of things that that you all have said. So, um, first of all, uh, Chris, you mentioned 2030. What's that? Why is that important? Uh, yeah, if you've heard of the um, the 2030 challenge um, uh, from the AIA, it's uh, and maybe Phil's going to be better at, at talking about this, but it's it's the point at which um, a lot of architecture firms sign on um, to be a part of the 2030 challenge, and that is to be um, carbon neutral by 2030 um, and uh, there's some steps to go along the way and it really has to has to do with actually tracking what you're doing and what you're building and energy modeling all your projects and um, uh, and sort of uh, tracking your progress towards carbon neutrality and you know I know you know Phil's firm is doing a great job at, at um, to, I think he, his firm jumped on it uh, you know prior to ours um, you know we're um, maybe maybe a little late to the party, but we've been doing this stuff for a long time, so it's, we have to retro. We're retro doing pretty well, Chris. Don't yeah. tell you short. You're, you guys are doing amazing work, and it's really all the same ilk. Yeah, and, we're, yeah, we're practically the same, is what you're saying. We're basically right, we're the same like, person. <laughs> we're like so, twins. So with with this, um, with with putting embodied carbon at the top of the list, um, and um, this this could be a this could be a nonsensical question, so just tell me if it is. But what if you run into a situation where, like, you know, you have lower embodied carbon in a siding type versus a siding type that you might have more durability, lo more longevity with? Um, are we at a point now, at least in, in your thinking, where you you go with the low you go with the low carbon because it's so important to do it right now? It it is so hard. You, that is that is the hardest question. I think I think right all of us like face yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, one particular material is, is you know, has higher recycled content, uh, lower embodied energy, but is way more resource efficient or something like that. Um, and the other, you know, and maybe, but maybe, you know, last has much stronger durability and everything. Um, and then the, uh, another project or product is great with embodied carbon. And I see the question in the chat about embodied carbon again. I'll hit it one more time, but embodied carbon just meaning the amount of energy it took to make something, and that energy correlates to the amount of carbon that got put into the atmosphere in order to make that thing. And so some materials, uh, let's pick on aluminum since we're probably not gonna talk about aluminum siding anymore. I mean, just like, so aluminum is a hugely, embodied, the, the embodied carbon in making aluminum is, is enormous. It's I mean, so, but we have aluminum clad windows. So like, the, do we give aluminum cladding a pass because it's performing, it's just tiny bits of aluminum that's performing really well as the weathering surface of our windows. Do you know, how do you balance that versus, you know, the, the durability of wood? I mean, the architect has to use a little of his gut, at least right now, until we get a, a good carbon calculator those are coming online right now. There's the EC3 carbon calculator. It's not very exhaustive. Um, Beam is coming out, um, which I think that's in beta right now. And everyone's really excited about that um, for materials. Um, Phil, am I missing any other carbon calculators? It's it's kind of a new game. Uh, one click. Yeah. I mean, there's a few things out there that are being developed. But, you know, Brian, you know, I, I, I think... I think we're in this interesting transition time that the materials we have now very well might not be the materials we have in 10 years, even five years that are responding to just these questions. I mean, embodied carbon has just got to the top of our list. Like it's on only the top of a few of our lists, but man, it needs to go there fast. And very soon the manufacturers and you know, suppliers are gonna meet the demand of, of what we start specifying if we say it's important. Yeah, uh, Braden, are are in your experience, are manufacturers starting to look at this? Yeah, I mean, it's a challenge for everybody, right? I mean, Boral as a business has always been very environmentally friendly, but it's a new challenge. And through manufacturing, you've got to look at all the different systems in place and see where things can be adjusted for you know 
just what is being demanded. Um, if you've got a product out there that no one is asking for, then it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if this demand is out there and you can work to create that material to supply that demand, then you've got a win-win. And, you know, I can tell you, you're constantly as a manufacturer looking at the next five years, the next 10 years and trying to meet those needs of sustainability and performance. Yeah. It's a balance. It's a, it's a hard number to come to, which is one of the, one of the biggest challenges with this is like, like I could, I could put Braden right on the spot and say, hey, what's the embodied carbon of, of a one by six, you know, foot of boral. Uh, uh, and oh, I, I'm also learning boral is what we're saying, not boral. So like, I don't know how long I've been yeah, saying it's boral. Motto? No, we, it's boral, um, boral as far as I say, but yeah. But I it's, both ways. And I, I couldn't give you that answer. You know, right. I mean, I don't think that that, has trickled down to my level yet. You know, I mean, a lot of what I do is work with specifiers like yourselves to drive specs, but I think in a lot of cases, many of us don't ask the questions, you know, we're in there with resources such as yourselves and it's a great opportunity to learn. And I think that's a place where, you know, a lot of us get this information from is our relationships with folks like yourselves, because it's not front of mind every day for us. Right. It's, it's really right. Hard for yeah, it's really hard for manufactured products to, I mean, all the testing that they got to go through just to hit the market and be, and then put a warranty on it or something like that. And then throw on there that architect says, oh, hey, what, what is the embodied carbon of this uh, material? And it's, and they're like, I, I don't know. I don't know. And they got to go figure that out. But I tell you, the companies that do, the I mean, and there aren't many. I mean, literally, it, you could call up almost any siding company and say what's the embodied carbon of x of your product and they you they'll, have, they'll put you on hold and come back and you won't get the answer and i'm hoping that in just like two or three years maybe sooner everyone has that answer um right so. yeah I'd be, i'm curious to see what boral's doing now i mean you know historically hand it to boral always being a little bit ahead of the curve i mean a number of years ago it was a, a pretty hot product i remember when they first first offered it locally, we were excited, pretty excited about it and continue to specify it. Um, it also brings to my mind another question. One of the things that I think was not on your list, Brian, is toxicity. I know it's, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's siding, right? It's outside. We don't tend to worry about it so much, but you know, the, the, the folks who are cutting and applying this stuff, it's a big deal. And we're starting to talk about that a lot more in the industry as well. Yeah. yeah, that that's a it, it's a really good it's, it's a good point. And it's another thing that a lot of people don't know about, and they don't know where to get the information about. Especially, you know, contractors who are working in the field, they're just working with materials, and and maybe they're putting on what they think is the most appropriate respirator when they're you know when they're cutting you know some dusty material. But that's that's about as far as it goes because we're not specific enough about what's in the materials and what they're breathing in and. You know what what proper protocols are i mean we're just getting there with asbestos and lead paint right right um so yeah. it's with new materials i think we're still a little ways off from that um all right so so body carbon top of the list um after that you're 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 starting a new project a new house or remodel where do you start when it comes to thinking about siding where do you go next well i mean i mean i'll put this uh i mean cost is where i mean we what ballpark are we playing in i mean is really you know when we start off i mean if if you said i have money's no object chris tell me you know what whatever you, whatever you think is best i would probably go with a you know a local fsc certified you know like white cedar or something like that that is you know because it's fsc certified um, it could be actually carbon sequestering um, because it's regenerating. It's actually pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, building itself, and then we're storing it on the building while we grow some more and you know become a carbon sequestering factory. That's why bio-based materials are great for that. But but besides that, you know, it's it's local. It's naturally weather resisting. It does require maintenance and good detailing with rain screens, which I'm sure we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, but you know, there's that, there is that, it's not hundred percent maintenance free. It, it's, um, so, you know, there's that, there's like the, the torrified 
products. We, our office has been using quite a bit of that. Um, and that's, um, I don't know how I don't know how nerdy we all are, but but a torrified. If we do tor, Phil, you give me the hook if I'm going too far. <laughs> torrified wood is you're, like, just t- you're just eating up all of Brian's questions, I'm sure. But you go. I probably am. I probably am. I'm ruining the show. If, if we won't if, run out of things to talk about, I assure you. Right. If, if you right, we we can talk about all kinds of things. Um, cocktails later if we have to. But um, <laughs> if you take right. if you take a local poplar let's say and you stick it in a kiln on it's a really hot kiln like 500 degrees or more and there's no oxygen in it so it can't catch on fire can't ignite and you cook it that's pyrolysis that's how charcoal is made but basically you don't go that far with it but you basically cook out all the gases from it and all the you basically rob all the energy out of it and some companies actually take that those gases and steam and smoke and reignite it to fire up the kiln so it almost cooks itself and then that product ends up being a, I have siding here, by the way, guys. I don't know if you, I came prepared like a Boy Scout. So it, it, oh, looks, Chris, it, it looks like yeah. that. Um, this is this is not aged. It will gray and whatever, but Evan, yeah, yeah I, I got you, Phil. You've um, got I, me. I have nothing. <laughs> anyway, but um, so we might use that because it is, it is local. Um, if it's FSC certified, which is hard to get, but um, and then I've been talking too much. And then then if, if the price point, if sometimes we're dealing with durability or um, other prices, Phil, I'll let you or Braden jump in with. Of course, Braden's going to say Boral. To me, it's, you know, it's a lot about the maintenance as well. Um, the lifestyle that you live. I've got I'm a young family, two young children. I've got a lot of balls beating against the side of the house, the garage. Mm-hmm. Um, and so to me, that's very important. Maintenance also becomes an issue. You know, I, Being a young family, I don't want to necessarily take that time to have to go out and repaint or stain the deck and all these different things. And so I look for a lot more products that are going to be more well maintenance free, not that there's such a thing, but a lot less maintenance. Um, I don't want to have to schedule that in on an annual basis or biannual basis. For me, I'd love to just clean it off, you know, spray it off of the hose, give it a quick rinse and move on with my day. So, you know, to me, that's worth a pretty big cost. Also knowing the life cycle costs of a building and what it takes to run that. You know, I appreciate the better product on the front end so that I'm not chasing that good money with bad later. So I think it's very important to give the customer all the different types of, you know, products, not just looks, because you'll get different performances on it. Yeah. And with today's technology, you know, just speaking to our true exterior product, you know, that's 70% fly ash. It's a poly ash material, 70% byproduct of burning coal. I mean, it's fly ash. And so you're taking that landfill waste stream material out and making something more of it, a cladding. And so, you know, it's almost like rescuing some of that debris and, and putting it back in. It's, um, you know, that that's my feel good story for you to decide. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. And, uh, and, the, and so, you know, for my two cents, yes and yes. Like we got to do all those things considered cost and durability and and maintenance. But man, it's got to look good, right? I mean, that's why they hire us to make something look really pretty. If it can't look pretty, um, and me, you know, as an architect, you want something that kind of help you, you know, meet you at your creativity point. You want some flexibility. You want to play with it a little bit. If everybody in the world is doing a four inch exposure and that's all you got. You know, it's not as interesting to me. I like the uh, ability to to play with it a little bit. So there's there's got to be that aspect in a product to keep it interesting. Yeah. So let me. I want to I want to follow up on style and looks in just a sec. But but before we before we get away from maintenance, um, when we when we talk about maintenance with siding, are we essentially talking about um, finishing it or refinishing it if it's painted or stained and and washing it occasionally? Is there anything I'm not thinking of that when it comes to maintenance? Um, yeah, sometimes the movement of that product, whatever that product is, like, um, uh, like, oh, hey, do you guys remember certain teed um, fiber cement siding? I mean, that. Of course. Yeah, I mean, it. Heard of the company. Yeah, yeah you heard of that guy. Well, the, the thermal expansion on that stuff, I mean, it caused real problems. I guess there's a lot yep. of re- there was a lot of recall on it, and it's. I remember when that was being marketed, just like the Hardy. Everyone thinks of fiber cement. I don't want to turn this into a let's all bash fiber cement 
uh, segment of this, but because I, I know I've I've specified quite a bit of that stuff over the past, so it's you know it's not it, it has its place. Um, but the fiber cement, it, it's they tout it as a pre-finished product that doesn't require painting. Well, that's kind of not true. It's going to absorb water, and especially if it's detailed in a position that where it's going to see some bulk um, water. So that means its shape is going to its dimension is going to change. It can be more than just losing paint. It you know seams and gaps can open up and it can move. Yeah. Same with wood. So I I can tell you you know prior to this I spent another decade with a prominent siding manufacturer in fiber cement. And, you know I've got my my house is brick, but the gables are all fiber cement in the garage, and it's been about twelve years, and yeah, it, it needs some maintenance. Um, it, it's it needs it. It's probably double the cycle, triple the cycle of cedar, but it still it still needs attention, most certainly. Yeah. So um, when it comes to um, Chris, you were talking about some some local um, wood wood products and yeah. um, or wood because <laughs> yeah. you know it's it's wood at that point. Um, and there's some <laughs> there's some. Uh, there's some wood siding that is that is you know naturally ha is is pretty durable, right? You know, cedar is yeah. a pretty durable material. And I've always been curious about um, professionals like yourselves' thoughts about actually putting finishes on these products that are sort of natural, naturally durable. It almost seemed always seemed to me like as soon as you put a finish on cedar siding, you're just creating work for yourself. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Oh wait, go Phil. Yep. Yeah. I mean, that's just it. You know, I you know. It, if we can leave it alone, just leave it alone. You know, like, like Chris said before, Caesar doesn't last forever, but the moment we treat it, that means we have to keep up with it to some extent. We're altering it. You know, it, there's so much dependent on what you like. Some people really just like the consistent finish and don't like the natural weathering um, because sometimes it's inconsistent and uneven. You know, that's, I dig that totally. Um, and to me, it's the most sustainable answer uh, you, you just have to like it. Yeah. It doesn't get much better than that though. Yeah. In my opinion. And not, not everyone does. I'm seeing a chat comment right now. Not, not everyone likes that weather look. We run into that. Right, sure. sure. I'm, I'm fine. Naturally graying, you know, just, uh, <laughs> my houses, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Look at you. Um, That's and it. you know, uh, I, and I, I actually like that look and I think it's done well, showing that patina of time is, is fine. I'm, I'm great with it, but I know not everyone's on board with that. And we do do coatings. And I think um, this, if we can talk about rain screens now. I think it, if you give that wood, let's, let's say we're doing wood, let's say we're doing pine. Let's say you're doing like, this is, this is like Maybach stuff right here. It's, it's pre-finished all sides. I think this is spruce. It's not even cedar. Right. It comes, it comes with, yeah. It comes with a warranty on it. And, you know, and that to us here in Maine, that's a local product if you can get it. But uh, that's a whole other dynamic is we're in this weird time that I'm sure everyone can complain about for a long time. But but anyway, that it comes with a solid stain on it. Having a stain instead of a, um, a coating is a real smart move for um, sealing, coating, painting wood painting all sides of that wood. I mean, all sides, the cut ends even more so um, and hitting that. And then having the ability for that piece of wood to dry on the backside, which is a rain screen technology, technology being a very advanced word for putting strapping on a wall and letting air, <laughs> but, but it does mean good detailing. So like if your, if your wood can dry out and dry out equally on both sides, because if it can't, you know, it cups, you know, if one side's wet and the other's not, it's like your watercolor paper. It will bend and, and cup. And you're like, what's going on? Well, if, if both sides are equal and they dry, then, uh, yeah, you know, it, it, it'll last so much longer and the paint will, it's, it'll be more stable in the paint or stain, I should say, will stay on much, much longer. So um, before we go, before I, I ask you all more about rain screen details, um, uh, David would like to know what the product is you just mentioned. You held up a, a sample and- I did, I mentioned I mentioned Maybach siding. Maybach, as in, M uh, there you go, Maybach. As in 
Partially in Maine, partially in Quebec. In Quebec. Wow. We, wow. That's where it got the name. <laughs> it's right on the border. Pretty right. fun. And it comes in all kinds of profiles as pre-stained. Originally, these guys were doing, um, they're known for their cedar shingles, right? And they came up with a great system for code pre-finishing, pre-coding their cedar shingles, which is also a really great, in my mind, um, siding material because it's local. You can get FSC. Well, actually, I don't know if through Maybec, but... Um, and they applied that same technology to the to spruce siding, so it comes in any solid stain you can think of, really. But if you can get it again, because it's on back order everywhere. So. I think. Oh, I was Go just going to say, as a manufacturer, the challenge you guys mentioned is chasing that moisture and movement, right? I mean, that's what causes all the issues, whether it's the movement, you know, breaking the bond of the paint, the adhesion, the moisture causing rotting and warping, and so. I think a lot of cases it is in the coating, but in many cases you can find a lot of products that in and of themselves are resistant to both the moisture and the movement. Yeah. And, you know, in today's world with the assistance, like you mentioned, of the rain screens, it's just added protection that can really give that entire product, which is your design, that entire building, you know, what it needs. So would, would one of you just for, for anyone who's uh, who's tuned in that, that doesn't know what a rain screen is, can one can someone explain what a rain screen detail is and and why a little bit more about uh, about why it's so important? Sure, I'll, I'll do it. Um, so a, a rain screen basically takes the siding that we typically used to put directly on the sheathing and lifts it off that sheathing and creates uh, an airspace, a gap effectively between that material and the sheathing. So what that does, it allows, it assumes water is going to get past that first layer of siding um, and lets that water drip down to the underside to the base. And it also creates airflow on all sides of these materials. So they'll dry out more evenly. Um, like Chris said, if you do that, it'll keep it from cupping. It'll, it'll just extend the life of your materials. And and has benefits for your wall assembly and drying, and it's just it's really probably um, should be considered best practice in almost every, almost every climate now. And I know that you know Canada right has put it in their building codes. Maybe it'll be in ours soon. And I don't know, Braden, do you um, at, at, do you guys talk about that as a detail that maybe should become sort of standard installation detail? Yeah, I mean, depending on the products that we manufacture, some of them actually have a built-in rain screen. When you look at our panelized stone system, the nail flange has that assembled, so it's kicked off. Um, we look at some different siding products that have a built-in milled screen, and so it is. It's about exiting that water away from the assembly. And to your point, I mean, it's not always about the water getting in. It's also allowing that water to escape. And if you use a product that doesn't cycle moisture and you're trapped tight against that wall, doesn't have the ability to breathe. And a lot of times it just causes damage that we don't see from the front. Um, and it doesn't expose itself until over time. And a rain screen can help prevent a lot of that damage long-term for a minimal cost as well. Yeah. Question, Braden, do you require that boral installations have rain screens in order for no. them to be so warranted? But we do require at minimum a drainable house wrap. And that is because the boral when sitting tight against the wall doesn't cycle moisture. It doesn't have cellulose fibers to draw that moisture into it. And so it can be put right down tight to grade. It doesn't, you don't have to worry about clearances when it comes to moisture and things of that nature. And so if it's tight to the wall and you have any moisture trying to escape out of that building or neutralize, it gets trapped. And so by having that drainable house wrap, thank you, Chris. You're welcome. We'll bore out unfinished, or this is the primed. I yep, guess. the B groove. Um, yeah. And so that sitting flat against the wall doesn't give the ability for that moisture to escape and that rain screen or drainable house wrap allows for that pressure to equalize and that to drain. And it's just an effective assembly, in my opinion. Yeah. I think part of the problem, too, with rain screens, though, is, you know, a lot of times people choose siding products and they follow the wall. And so if it's not straight or you've got some bowing in the studs or those rain screens aren't installed properly, it's going to give the impression of a bowed siding. And so it's very important to make sure that they are installed correctly because it will telegraph through that finished product if it's done wrong. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and especially putting strapping over, you know, a lot of builders putting strapping over, um, you know, mineral wool insulation, for example, now, or anything that's just a little bit squishy. And you do have to take the time to make sure you plane those, those your furring strips. And, and of course, furring strips aren't the only way to go. There's also 
You know, there's some products you can buy that are very helpful, especially if you're installing different siding types, maybe cedar shakes or something like that. Um, Mike just Mike has one question about rain screen, so we may as well answer now. Um, he wants to know what the best air gap is, and he uh, dimension. He says half inch? Question mark. It it kind of um, it's usually three quarters for us because we're using a one by material for for the vertical strapping. Um, but it doesn't and, have to. Be, um, it can be a lot smaller. Yeah. You know, there's there's these uh, matrix materials that are thinner than that. Um, yeah. And now there's there's sheet materials that hydrogap that actually has bumps, and they're really just saying that you need to make yeah, it so a, a drop of water can't can't hide yeah. in there; it's going to fall through. So you know whether it's as good, I'm not sure. Right. You know, is, is bigger better? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's more airflow, so right. You know, we we start with the three quarter inch, Chris, just, just like you. Yeah, I can tell you that the Canadian rule is ten millimeters, so. Yeah, but we don't know what that is. Ten. Yeah. All right. So let's let Phil. Phil had mentioned style, and this is something that I definitely wanted to talk about. So you know, I I have I have a bit of a modernist streak. So I love um, I love all sorts of siding types. Like you know, whether it's vertical siding or you know the big panels, you know that are all in plane on the wall, or whether it's like really open joint siding. And I love the looks of that stuff. But when my I'm also very practical, and these two things are in conflict a lot. And my practical side says that siding should be horizontal and lapped because it it's number one job is to shed water. So if you guys could talk a little bit about about style and getting looks and still having siding that's doing its job and is durable and how you think about that. Yes, I, I'd say hundreds of years of carpenters, uh, maybe <laughs> thousands, you know, lapping their siding. I mean, that's technology that is hard to argue with. Um, and I think I think those details are really wise. Um, but I think some of our modern materials, boral is an excellent example. I mean, water is not as big a deal to boral. I mean, if I were doing pressurized rain screen, um, a pressure equalized rain screen application, like you were talking about, like open gaps or something like that, where really your water, your primary bulk moisture water barrier is behind that as well, then yeah, that might be a good, choosing a material that can, you know, see a lot more uh, weathering uh, and and dimensional change could be a, a better idea, uh, but um, yeah, in terms of like the panel products, uh, that's that is a good question because I, I think like the the um, hardy uh, panels and fiber cement panels start to th that's a whole industry. All these different panels or metal panels to you know span these do do these modern spans. Um, I know LP. Someone was mentioning LP in the chat. LP. Smart side has like you know board and batten style uh, engineered siding materials. I mean, Phil. I mean, do you? What you got a modern house and somebody's like, I want to, I want a big span. I want this big span of open flat space. What do you pick? What do you? What's your go to? Or do you? Uh, you know, I, I I hesitate to say a go to because you know they're yeah. all my children and some. Oh, yeah. <laughs> perform, you know, I there's certain reasons. You know, I I like different things and. And, you know, sometimes I'm, I just want to try something new just for the fun of it. You know, yeah. sometimes we're architects too. You know, sometimes we create our own problems. So we have something to solve, you know, we just, uh, whoa, dude. You know, do some stuff like that. You know, it, it's, it's true. You know, and I, I love the open gap siding that Brian's talking about. I think, yeah. I think the, that it is really contemporary and it's a tricky one. You know, yeah. we're doing that in a couple projects now and it was a little hard to solve. How do you know what's behind it? Are you going to see that? You know, and how do you fasten these things? Um, what about the movement? Stable. Yeah, right. You know, how thin can these things be be stable? Like, oh, again, like, can we can we vary the exposure? Can we make some thinner and some thicker? Yeah. What problems is that going to cause? We, you know, we are kind of, you know, we're called professionals because you know we're good at what we do in general. So, you know, if we can make something look good and and that's our first task. It's our job to solve it and, and, and make it durable and make it work. And that's kind of the, the fun challenge of what we do. So, you know, lapping is, is great, but we don't always do that. And so when, you, if you do uh, open joint siding, I mean, are you, 
I don't know how to ask this question really, but are you assuming that the siding's not doing much, keeping a little bit of water, a little bit of light off of what's behind it, but otherwise you're really just, you're saying is that, is what's behind the siding capable of? It, it's correct? gotta be, right? You have to, you have to spend a little bit more money on that membrane. You know, we've been specifying a um, front of quattro is what I think it's called, uh, 475, and, you know, it's all, it's, it's all black. It can hold up to UV. Um, and it doesn't have stuff on it. So you don't have to see, you know, the little words tie that coming through or, you know, and so it, it's kind of invisible and it does a great job, but it, but it ain't cheap. Um, but it, it's, it's a great solution to. But the, the, to open gap, the open gap rain screen, it's supposed to be, you know, it, it's supposed to remove the driving force from the water hitting those membranes so that the only force is gravity and it drains. And so you don't have, um, you know, the driving force on it. That's the theory behind it anyway. So when you, by dry, you don't have capillary action, you don't have, um, you know, so you don't have water held in tension behind the siding and you don't, um, and you don't have a presser differential, right? Because it's right. just, it's just all outside. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, Braden, thought, thoughts on style given, given the product line that you, that you know about? You know, I mean, what's interesting to me is I see Chris pull up a lot of flat wall, you know, older kind of profiled products, and that's really made a resurgence as of late. And, you know, our true exterior craftsman collection really is around that. But, you know, for me, I've really grown to like the look of the mitered corner again. Yes. And that is, you know, I used to not be all for that, but it's just, it's a design that, I can't get away from. So yeah, that's that's my big thing as of late, and that's something yeah. you can do with coral. That's, yeah, that's good. That's that's something you can't do like with LP. Like LP Smart Side is, may, you know, from a budget. I mean, that's a good in my mind. That's a good budget project or product. Um, I don't want to do vinyl siding, um, and that might be my next, you know, my go to. But you have to butt everything. I mean, even even trim. I mean, we don't. It's you have to. You can't mind that stuff, so that's you know yeah. it's not well, but um, yeah, right. Same thing with the fiber cement sheets. You just yeah, you know, you know, even the claps. You just can't do that in the corners because they're just too thin. Yeah, and I saw someone mention dew point of fiber or larger larger sheets means where the dew point is 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 critical, and I think. Even for um, fiber cement and even these other products, I try to get a rain screen back behind I me. Mean, I think you know our office is always trying to get some air movement back there, so that if there is condensation or even solar drive, someone said on some some nerd on the chat box said solar drive absorption <laughs> into that space where the heat is going to actually push that moisture back, you know, into the into that uh, sheathing. You know, there's a way for that to to, um, to respire out to the um, that vented space. So rain screens. If there's one thing you take away from this webinar, start making sure you have rain screens in your uh, siding assemblies. Yeah, for sure. Um, and and um, now we've gotten we've talked a little bit about installation details, and you know, Braden mentioned mitered corners, and you know, get, having a installer. Uh, in, you know, install siding with mitered corners is going to be much more expensive than having them install it butted up against corner boards. So um, let let me ask a cost question. Um, you know, anyone can can get a cost estimate for um, for these materials, but um, it, is does cost vary significantly in terms of the labor um, and other details <laughs> needed from from one siding type or one siding detail to the next? And how significant can that be? Yeah. I would say it can vary extensively. Um, as a manufacturer, you know, we have panels, uh, vinyl siding panels, shake panels that are five feet in length, and they go up really quickly, really easily, and they're self-staggering, blah, blah. But now I move to the true exterior side, or maybe I'm doing a cove Dutch lap with mitered corners that I need to carry around, you know, 250 lineal feet with all these different bump outs. It's a lot bigger of an application and, and you just, it takes a different installer and a different level of craftsmanship and understanding to be able to do that. Um, and so, yeah, you will, whether it be, you know, a fiber cement lap siding versus a cedar shake, you're going to incur more, 
man hours. I mean, at the end of the day, your coverage is that square of siding, that 10 by 10 area, and your cost is going to be allocated as to how long does it take to cover that square. Yeah. Yeah, we have this funny thing, you know, it happens in New England that we used to see these old houses that had um, clapboards on the front of them, but shingles on all the on the sides and the rear, because the claps were more expensive and the shingles were cheap and labor was like nothing. And now right. it's, of course, it's reversed. The shingles are expensive because the labor has gone up. So it's more expensive to have one person out there nailing these things one at a time. Yeah. So that so so it can be significant. Then I guess is the answer to the question in terms of like in yeah. terms of the cost of, of putting siding on a house. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, Cindy asked about bamboo extreme. I guess that's a siding type. Do you guys do you guys know about that? That's a negative just, here. I don't have much experience with it, but I have seen it and heard about it. Yeah. So, okay. Sorry, Cindy. I wish. All right, Cindy, next, we'll, we'll see if we can answer that somewhere else. Um, and John wants to know about steel panel siding. In fact, and this is a great question because I recently saw some projects with Corten steel and a, another look that I really like. Um, yeah. So any any thoughts on steel? Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd love Corten steel. We, you know, let's... Let's table the embodied carbon discussion for just a moment, okay? <laughs> because they're definitely higher embodied carbon. But you know, this is one of the trade-off questions, that, right, Brian? This is a tough one because we core ten steel. If you get panels of core ten steel, man, do they last? You know, the beauty of core ten steel. If you don't know what core ten steel is, it's a naturally rusting steel. It it creates this rusting exterior that really protects the the steel, the, the rest of the material behind it, even though it's like a you know couple microns thick. It's what you see on ships and what you see on bridges a lot of times. And, and it's a um, you know fairly astounding stuff. So it, it lasts and lasts and lasts, and it's got this beautiful natural feel to it, like we see in you know weathered cedar, if you like that. Um, but again, like we, we love the idea of there's this material that reflects the place that it's in, that it is dif differentially weathered around the corners and where it's, you know, it's where it's got an overhang. And, and you'll see it a lot in Europe where uh, people are trying to match these historic materials and natural feels to it. So it, it really, it has that vibe of, a, of just a wonderful natural material. Um, and man, it lasts. So and tell us, so how, how bad is it on the embodied carbon scale? You know, uh, you know, it's not aluminum, right? But, you know, the things that, you know, if you're making broad swaths in your head about, like, what's bad, concrete is high embodied carbon and steel is high embodied carbon. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it just, those are the two. If we could eliminate those, we'll be doing a lot better. So bad on me for saying what I just said, but we have done it a few times. And, you know, it'll last 100 years. What else can we say that about? All right. Shasuki, I see. Um, I shouldn't read the chat. I should let Brian read the chat. Sorry. Oh, no, no. I, yeah. I, I, like, I like that look a lot. Tell us what that is, Chris. Uh, okay. Yeah, all right. Shasuki Ban, if you don't know, it's, it's all the rage. It, you know, it's, what it is is um, Japanese. It, comes, it sounds Japanese. It is Japanese. It's, it's charred cypress. Japanese cypress. So like real Shasugi Ban, people have to realize it's starting with a, a wood that is already naturally rot resistant cypress or, you know, like our cedar. And then they char it. I mean, it's an old tradition to char it to make it last longer. That char actually, it's it's a lot like a torification process where that, that, that wood on the outside is robbed of all of its energy. So it acts as a little protective layer. It will, it will rub off, it will wear off over time. So leaving it dark gray and black and or blackish, like instead of charred. But a lot of people, you know, you put it up charred and then you put a linseed oil over or some other oil over it. And, you know, it's pretty tough stuff, but it's a lot more than just burnt wood tacked up and left to be your siding. So it's yeah. really expensive and not, it's, it's not as easy as it might seem. Yeah, and I have seen some. I've seen some projects that um, it went up looking good, and 
and pretty quickly it just looked like the wood again. Yep. That's what I've heard a lot, Brian. You know, we've talked about it on so many projects, but that's what I'm hearing that in five years, it's not just Ugibon anymore. Phil, you you were gonna be doing a project doing the pine tar thing. You and I talked about pine tar as that's right. pine tar cut or uh, and a uh, green building advisor has a blog that someone started about you know using pine tar and then we jumped on the bandwagon and, and you were actually giving it a go, Phil. Tell me about that. Yeah, we haven't actually started the project um, breaks ground um, next week actually out in Durham, New Hampshire. And yeah, we've got this great project product that we're going to test um, for the first time. And I think it's, uh, it's a, a Swedish product. Um, I can't remember the name. But where where Vikings it. come from? Remember what it is? Yeah, um, but it is. It's natural pine tar, and man, it smells like pine. It's 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 pretty cool. I'll I'll report back. I'll let you know how it goes. Oh, first, but uh, also, we still don't have, we still don't have results yet. Okay, we need a part two, Brian, just for that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm interested in seeing this, and and I should yeah. note that there are some um, that Trisugi Ban. Um, there are some products available. Right. Uh, I've never seen any of them in person. I think Akoya Wood might be one of the brands that has a product. Why mm -hmm. use these, Brian? Like like this. <laughs> where they, uh, Akoya is a. Oh, we didn't. We even talk about acetylated wood. Acetylated wood, which is what Akoya is. Before you before you do this to it, it's basically pickled wood. It's a it's an, a, a, um, an acetylated acid. It's basically industrial strength vinegar that is pressure treated into the wood. And so it, it looks, actually looks like this. This is, oh, sorry. It just looks like, you know, wood and it's pretty dense, you know? And um, then they, then they cook it to give it that finish. And it's really just a finishing thing. It's very thin. So anyway. Yeah. Thermo, thermary is another therm. It's similar to the thermally modified wood. Um, mm -hmm. But just to talk about Chosugiban for a second, there's a company, um, just a little pitch, for Pioneer Millworks, and I oh, think they're in Hudson Valley. They yeah. do just gorgeous stuff, and they they control their shusugi bond wonderfully. And we just used their larch um, for a project. Uh, so check those guys out. It's it's, it's like the best shusugi bond I've seen, and most consistent if you're going to go that route. Oh, very cool. All right, um, I think we have a couple of. Uh, a couple of questions that are perfect for Braden. Um, Cindy wants to know if you can get true exterior pre-finished. So we manufacture it available primed. Um, however, most local markets do have pre-finished. Here in Chicago, we've got a custom color pre-finished line. Um, you know, I know in the Northeast, many, many of the lumber yards and suppliers out there do have access to pre-finished material. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I one of the one of the things that that was really um, amazing to me when when we started to see these pre-finished siding materials was that you know you put up your siding and you're done right you, you don't have there's no next steps of of painting the house and that's a wonderful thing uh, but I, I haven't been able to kind of see enough projects over um, over time to see how those pre-finished products hold up does anyone have you guys have you guys used any pre-finished siding products and been able to sort of observe them over time yet um Fiber cement comes to mind again, and and yeah, it's not it's not as awesome as everyone thought it was when they bought it. It's a painted product and needs maintenance. So yeah, I would say that the performance of the finishes is directly correlated to the movement that's associated with the like product. So if you're painting something that has an excessive movement ratio, then you're going to have you know more maintenance quicker. And so using a product that might support that moisture movement um, is going to give you a better chance of long-term performance. Yeah, for sure. Um, the other question was for, uh, for you, Braden, was from Lewis, and he wants to know if oral culture stone, country ledge stone, exterior wall, if the wall gets chipped, is it going to expose a different color or is it the same color throughout the material? Yes, so not typically my ball, but yes, I can answer that. So the synthetic iron oxide pigments that we use in manufacturing cultured stone are just applied into the trays. So they are surface. They'll penetrate about an eighth of an inch, but it's not all the way through. If you do have some chipping, you can always reach out to one of the local suppliers or reps for a touch-up kit. 
Um, there's also some other tricks and things that you can find on YouTube and anywhere else. But it is just superficial or sur surface applied, rather. Yeah. Right on. So we had a, we've had a couple of questions about fire resistance, and I, I I know that you know I don't know how familiar you all are with fire resistance in the area that you work, but I know in a lot of parts of the country it's pretty darn important. So, um, any thoughts on siding and, and fire resistance? You're asking a couple of manners. We're in a water rich state. We don't. Yeah. Don't do <laughs> um, no, I, I mean for real, we don't. We don't. Uh, that doesn't occupy our our you know design tree matrix nearly as much as it does out west, which and it's getting more and more serious. So I, uh, I don't. So I, yeah, I've had I mean throughout a couple different portions in my career, I've had exposure to you know different high fire counties in California um, through Colorado, and it's a big deal. Um, a lot of times the design happens before the question occurs of what what you need to meet. And so there's always that give and take and that push pull, um, unfortunately. But, you know, again, when selecting the products, it's about, you know, where are they going to be installed? Is it a water rich area like yourselves where you're more worried about the humidity and maybe thermal movement? Or is it a drier heat where there's more, you know, forest fire prone? So it's about the selection and you know, there's class A's, there's class B's, but it's always about the assembly and that whole entire product being that building. So it's more than just the cladding when it comes to that. Yes, for, for sure. And, and uh, Timothy and whoever it was that asked about uh, fire resistance earlier, um, if you yeah, keep your eye on our on our emails and our website, because we do have a, a webinar coming up in September with uh, architect who designs houses out in wildfire country in California, all about this topic. So um, we're going to be covering it hopefully in, in depth this September. So uh, stay tuned. And I'm curious. I was just going to say, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that our true exterior was certified by Cal Fire and Wooey. Yeah. All right. Is that what you were going to say too, Phil? That's exactly it. That, you took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Man. Um, we have another question from uh, Robert about uh, ascend siding from Alside. I I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, I am. Um, so that is Alside's answer to kind of the fiber cement engineered wood category. Um, so it's a higher density, thicker vinyl composite type material that you know directly competes with fiber cement and engineered wood. So that kind of same price category, but they speak to perhaps a longer maintenance cycle or less of a maintenance cycle than that of those other products. So new product um, really was just gonna launch pre-pandemic and you know, like a lot of things kind of fell apart, but it is out there and it's a good product and it's available at you know, all the associated materials yards. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so, um, we're, we're coming up on an hour here and I want to, I want to, I want to bring this full circle. I want to start where I want to end where we started. Um, I want to come back to what, because, you know, you, Chris and Phil, you, you both, um, you both brought up the embodied carbon right away and put it at the top of the list here. So someone who heard that and in, in any part of the country, right, they might not be in, in your neighborhood. Someone who heard that and they need siding for their, for their project, um, what do you recommend they, where do you recommend they start or what do you recommend they do? Well, one, one thing that we can start with is if you're specifying wood, specify FSC lumber and your siding, forest store chip certified. Um, so we know it's sustainably harvested um, and, and that'll go a, a long way to reducing your embodied carbon. So, you, you know, I, you can get that. It's more and more available. Um, you will pay a little bit more, but it's the kind of thing that we just need to do for our planet. We just start with those specs. Like we start with the thing that should be done. Um, and if it comes down to it, you know, we don't do it in as many places, but let's do the responsible thing and, and start with FSC wood across the board. And I'll, I'll tack on to that. If they, if, if you know, like that, you know, know your farmer, know where your food comes from kind of a thing. You can play that same game with with wood products. Know your know your sawmill. I mean, know where they get it from, 
And if it comes from, we're lucky in Maine, we've got some sustainable forests all around us. We're the most forested state in the United States. So we're lucky that we can actually, with a few phone calls, track down where we can find a local mill, find where they get their lumber and, you know, do our own sort of FSC background check if you can't get that FSC. Um, but uh, beyond that, you know, working with bio-based products is like a natural route to um, uh, a more carbon uh, sequestration. That's a hard word, sorry, late in the thing. But um, <laughs> so, like, I don't have, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have like the, well, Braden probably says Boral is probably your best bet, but I don't know if anyone else has um, a go-to for, for yeah. the best. I wouldn't say that, you know, I mean, I get asked all the time, what's the perfect product? It's, you know, there isn't, it's what's the application, you know, what, what are we trying to solve here and accomplish? And I think that's where it needs to start. And then with that, you have to think about the budget and that'll kind of narrow down where, where your choices are. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. All right. Well, Hey, this was, this was a wonderful discussion. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you want to say about um, siding? About siding? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess not. I, I mean, Phil and I did, we did a podcast on this and we did make a, uh, a chart. It's an unscientific chart that we got a lot of compliments on by being unscientific that basically puts our, our siding in those categories. That's how we ended up here, by the way. We did a podcast on siding and of all topics and then we're here. But um, if you look up Green Architects Lounge, find the siding podcast. It's already, I mean, we haven't done a podcast in a year. We're going to get back to it, but um, you can find that and then you can find it on greenbuildingadvisor.com, which is a ch child of findhomebuilding.com and, and um, you'll find a handy chart that will help you make decisions about siding. Yeah, that's great. I guess I should have mentioned Fine Home Building and Green Building Advisor, but thanks, Chris, for <laughs> bringing yeah, it up. And you can, it, man. When these guys get back to work and make a podcast again, I think you can find it everywhere that podcasts are, but we do post them on, on Green Building Advisor as well. So um, so you can find them there. Uh, and we're looking forward to it, fellas. So <laughs> Great. No pressure. Hey, no, I want to- the list. Chris. Just like you keep going. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank you. I want to thank Braden and Phil and Chris and, and thank Boyle for sponsoring. This was a really great, um, great evening. I learned a lot. I hope that we answered a bunch of questions. Um, yeah, have a great night, everyone. Ciao. Thank Thanks. you.